Hi, have you heard of Morutitte Hinglaj, a 1959 Indian Bengali language drama film? It revolves around a religious journey towards the sacred temple of Hinglaj. A group of pilgrims undertake the long perilous journey through the desert to reach the holy shrine where pilgrims can be washed off all their sins. Endure their walk of hundreds of miles through the desert, they face hardship and life-threatening challenges. I find this story a parallel to Canterbury Tales. That sort of journey, that sort of pilgrimage, and that sort of storytelling is here. Jeffrey Chaucer, the 14th century English poet who can be called the first national poet of England, composed his Canterbury Tales probably after 1387. This is the crowning achievement of Chaucer's life, which is of perennial importance, invaluable alike to the students of poetry and to the historians who aspire to delineate the social life of that Middle English, of that uh, Middle English period and to the philosopher. Hello friends, I am Ardhendu De and you are watching Eddie's English Literature. Today, we are going to discuss key points of understanding Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. We are going to discuss the frame of the stories, characters and uh, the characters of pilgrims and particularly Chaucer's ideology. In fact, we are going to discuss Canterbury as a whole. The art of storytelling has an Indian connection. The idea of an interrelated series of stories that we find in Chaucer's came from India via the Middle East and Italy. There are few notable and influential contributions to the world literature from India. Apart from epic tales of Ramayana and Mahabharata, we have Panchatantra, Vedala Panchabinshoti, and Jataka tales. Panchatantra consists of uh, five books of animal fables and magic tales in total. Some, uh, some 87 tales are there. The works self-proclaimed purpose is to educate the sons of royalty. The fables of Panchatantra found their way to Europe through oral folklore channels and by way of Persian and Arabian translation in around 700 AD. The other Petala Panchavinsati and Jataka tales which were uh, composed much later is a collection of a kind of tales. Betala Panchavinsuti is a legend within a frame story. They substantially influenced the very medieval writers and Chaucer was no exception in this regard. The other that I want to notably express here is 1001 Nights, a collection of Middle Eastern folk tales compiled in Arabic during the Islamic Golden Age that might have reached the Europe at the Chaucer's time. A thousand tales relied partly on Indian elements. The direct result of this type of series of tales is the Italian Decameron. The Decameron by Boccaccio is a collection of short stories that you know. The book is structured as a frame story containing 100 tales told by a group of seven young women and, and, and three men there was. They sheltered in a secluded villa just outside Florence in order to escape from this black death that was happening at that time. Now, Boccaccio probably conceived of the Decameron after the epidemic of 
1348 and compiled it by 1353 now so uh, chaucer had the decameron as his model and this decameron is rooted in the indian subcontinent through the series of tales from that i have told the jataka tales and that of panchatantra tales and that of uh, radha series of tales so you get the point the canterbury tales is a collection of stories set within a framing story of a pilgrimage to canterbury cathedral the sign of saint thomas becket the poet chaucer joins a band of pilgrims who assemble at the tabard inn outside london for the journey to canterbury the host of the inn proposes a storytelling contest to pass the time each of the 30 or so pilgrims the exact number uh, is quite doubtful is to tell four tales on the round trip arranging in status from a knight to a humble plowman they the pilgrims are a microcosm of the 14th century english society chaucer planned to write about 120 stories by making each of the 30 pilgrims tell two stories each on the way to canterbury and two more each on their way back and we can get this point from the uh, leaders the party the um, canterbury party that uh, the leader tells it in the prologue section but chaucer could write only 22 stories chaucer completed less than a quarter of his plan the work contains 22 verse tales and two remain unfinished and two long prose tales a few are thought to be pieces written earlier by chaucer the canterbury tales composed of more than 18000 odd lines of poetry is made up of separate blocks of one or more tales with links introducing and joining stories within a block today the canterbury tales is significant not only as the first great piece of english literature but also a realistic piece of literature that brings and illustrates the 14th century england more vividly than any of the most laborious history or any other historical treatises so from literary point of view from social point of view the canterbury tales is must read for the students of english literature so as we have learned that tales is a collection of stories of a band of pilgrims vividly described in the general prologue who assemble at the tabard inn outside london for the journey to canterbury ranging in status from a knight to a humble plowman we can get here at the very sum total of the english society a 14th century england is being pictureized here in this prologue section the story and the storytellers as well as the characters in the story combine uh, influences from many european traditions secular religious comic philosophical so these sum total of the character of the canterbury tales all these elements if we uh, brought uh, together uh, if if we connect together we can get a picture of england those elements are attached the pilgrims are here a group of pilgrims from varied backgrounds who recount often lasty tales to their way to the shrine of saint thomas a becket in the prologue chaucer has hit up the points of the several characters with unrivaled grace and dexterity by the degree of physiognomy dress eccentricity they are the moving picture gallery of the 14th century english society virtually covering every contemporary english class except the very lowest section or the lower section of the society now we will read 
the major characters that we find in the prologue section. We see before us these major characters in prologue. In the prologue segment, the descriptions of these characters are so vivid and so varied. The narrator is in the personage of Chosa, though not directly told. A somewhat detached, ironic, self depreciating uh, bourgeois figure can be seen here in the narrator. So, narrator or narrator's perspective, the entire prologue is being written. A chivalrous knight is another, the gentleman who loved truth, freedom, chivalry, and honor. A truly distinguished, idealized man. He battled Christians and non Christian crusades. His, his, his fight spanning 40 years over three groups of people, over 15, ballad, 15 battles covering the 100 years wars war in Prussia, Lithuania, and even Russia. He remained always victorious, plain and honest. He was going to Canterbury to thank the saint for preserving his life through the battle. He is the most prominent and respected character of the tales. So here the elite class, the elite segment of the society is being depicted by the character of Knight. Another notable character is the Eon Square, embroidered as a meat and as phase as in the month of May, the night song about 20 years of old is ladies man, handsome, curly hair, strong and agile, singing, playing the flute, high hearted, pleasant, talented and a fine horseman, knows how to joust, dance, ride, draw. His character anticipates the type of the Renesa courtier. He is in the Canterbury party out of pleasure. So, different characters have different perspective in this two. The knight's human, the other character, is ranked in service just above the groom, is so careful of his accountment. He is servant to the knight and square. A gamekeeper by profession, he looks to be outdoorsman, talented woodcarver like the image of Saint Christopher. He always carried a bow, a shield, arm guard of archery, a sword and a dragon. So these are the warrior section or warrior segment that has been depicted here. A nun, Madam Eglantai, or tender hearted prioress, spoke French but very poorly. After the school of Stafford and Bow, bears an upper class social stand, eats in a refined manner, physically big forehead, sign of intelligence in her character, we find certain nobility, but underscore there is vanity and fabulous. So, 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 this character is showing a justified depiction of the women folk. The mom, town fires, dressed in fine clothes, some even trimmed in fur, loved hunting, fine foods, had several good hunting dogs that he has very proud of. He was rather fat, very jolly and bald and tended to ignore the rules of the monastery. Everything he does is a violation of his monastic vows. Instead, he is wealthy, luxurious and a pleasant heart. The friar Hubert is an example of absolute corruption who thought that Instead of weeping and of prayers, man ought to give silver to the poor prayers. The white necked, he was jolly, merry, very festive in dress with expensive fabrics, but notoriously evil and cunning. He charged people to hear their confession, 
the more you paid the more uh, repentant you were as he is licensed to beg he even begged up of poor widows who had next to nothing so these are the systematic corruption or the corruption in charge that chosar has highlighted through his character the merchant who sedulously attended to his business and spoke his reasons full pompously he cons- convinces everywhere everyone that he was an expert in finance but the reality is that he is horribly in debt some serious intelligent cunning he sets up a safety patrol at the english channel safety for tradesmen however um, notably he commits no economic crimes usury and illegal foreign exchange deals so these are the trades these are the uh, businesses so that has been so not the business people that has been shown through his character the clerk of oxford a university student who preferred books to any other earthly pleasure and who uh, would gladly learn and gladly teach in in physique he is very thin almost underfed uh, threadbare clothing but has 20 hand written books with him he hasn't a sort secular employment yet still studying logic he did not talk often but when he did it was with great dignity and moral virtue so these are the respect character that chosar has depicted to him the sergeant of law one of the king's legal servant ever seemed busier than he was was dressed in party colored coat expensive silk sergeant means that he had to practice law with distinction for at least 16 years widely experienced he knew every law that ever existed in english soil very judgmental or very uh, the judgment very case uh, every crime uh, since the conquest he has acquainted with so he is a sort of learned fellow the franklin or a free man at whose house it snowed up meat and drink is a wealthy land owner but not of noble birth his social position is a matter of disputes but as it is told he acted as sheriff checking and auditing each person's property so he is a kind of income tax officer the sheep man who is a master of his job has all the ills of his times freely roving from south to north from spain to sweden he sometimes acts like cunning pirates the doctor of physics who study was but little in the bible used astronomy and astrology and and used his uh, patient's horoscope for information on how to treat them so then time medical practices and mal practices has been depicted through his character he is considered a perfectly practicing physician in league with the druggist worked with the pharmacist to make more money of of people he is familiar with medical authorities and their works he is not excessive in his own life very healthy not religious materialistic made a lot of money working during the plague uh, because he it had the opportunity uh, to earn money uh, in in man's disaster the character is itself a vivid study of the then time medical professions and Uh, notably uh, the same concept has not yet changed a lot now the most notable the wife of bath the gaily attired boxum wife of bath somewhat deep gap teeth large hips hidden by her clothing is an 
abiding interest among the pilgrims. She always wanted the front row in church and to be the first at any offering. She wore a heavy, heavy headdress, red stockings and new shoes. Now, as we fathom deep into her character, being an impersonate traveler, she went on other famous pilgrimages, Jerusalem, Rome and Compostela, Compostela, Cologne, everywhere she visited. Most interestingly, she is a new kind of feminine identity where she is independent minded, opposed to patriarchal control. Her episode of a pilgrimage also can be termed as a husband hunting campaign. Here, she is willing to get herself married once again. The poor person, the ideal Christian parish priest is very poor but rich in holy thoughts. Benign, patient, diligent and moral and humble was the principle to live the perfect life first. Then teach by example, he cared for his parishioners. Nothing could keep him from going to check on them. So the honesty in charge is being depicted through her through his character. The person's brother, the plowman, another ideal Christian man who, if it lay in his power, was always ready to work for the poor without hire. Ideal Christian man. He followed the two greatest commandments unruffled by pleasure and pain. Love God and love your neighbors as yourself is the motto in him. The stout miller, big and brown man who could wrestle anyone, was not overly honest and carried with him a bagpipe which he could blow and sound. Red birds, hairy, uh, hairy what on his nose, hair in his ear, black nostrils make this muscle man fierce here. The rib, a slender choleric man, short haired, thin, lean legged, bad tempered manager of a large estate, was able and efficient. Outwitting auditors and even lords, he has accumulated a huge fortune for himself. Now, another, the summoner. A man paid to some sinners to come to trap. With his fire red cherubin's face and red complexion, ball and lexions all over his face and speaks Latin. He is corrupt, easily bribed ecclesiastical uh, post one can get by bribing him. So this is another church corruption, um, the character who is in the uh, church and corruption, corrupt church is being depicted here. The pardoner with his wallet full of pardons come from Rome all hot and sold pardons and indulgences to those charged with sins with loud high pitched voice, long flexum hair, effeminate characteristics. He knew how to sing and preach to people to frighten them to buy the relics. He has made a lot of money selling his fake relics and obviously a corrupt ecclesiastical post. Now these are all corruptions or uh, corruption in charge has been depicted through his character. The jovial host of the Tavard Inn is a fit predecessor to mine host of the Gator and a Boniface. A hairy belly is a jolly character who offers a feast to the best storyteller as he is the judge of the stories. Again, he is the uh, coordinator of the heterogeneous company. So this character is a, a character of missing link. And he assimilates all these characters and make, a, uh, and make the journey most profitable and most enjoyable. The Mansible, a steward for dormitory 
of law students who are in the charge of buying food for the lawyers very frugal and straight most times outwitted by lawyers and ended up with money in his pocket his cunningness is most 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 noteworthy point here and uh, he is ironically described as wisdom of his uh, so uh, this kind of character is a mixed personage who whom we can find out in the english society of the 14th century there are other few characters the five guildsmen uh, notably a harvard star a dyer a carpenter a weaver a carpenter maker uh, belongs to a guild of statesmen somewhat powerful in his time they are luxuriously dressed their wives are demanding and controlling they want servants to carry their mantles and trains like a queen and they are the emerging social merchant groups and that merchant group uh, is being highlighted here and that is uh, the character in whom uh, chosar also belongs to now all these characters are telling different tales uh, the summoner's tale uh, uh, the clerk's tale so there are different kind of tales and those tales are how important uh, and how how these tales are telling the stories of uh, the then time is the another section another segment that i will study later so what do we find that uh, 30 pilgrims who are heading to canterbury and how chosar has accumulated their characters to make a panorama of the then time society is very interesting and noted this study from canterbury tales so i think this little bit of discussion will make you or lead you into understanding the very segment of 14th century england and from chosarian writer writing style you can also get uh, how to tell stories and how these stories are accumulated and to make a epic kind of uh, describing uh, um, the importance of uh, living tales so i think that uh, this little bit of discussion will further carry your interest towards canterbury tales and if you find any sort of uh, queries in your preliminary understanding of canterbury tales you can just pop up here and ask me question i will try my best to give some possible answers so like share comment and obviously subscribe to my channel thank you